before the ram had taken the bull's place as the beginning or leader of the heavenly signs, El Debaran, the star located in the bull's eye, was the brightest star in the constellation of Taurus and was called Ku Aku, whose name meant the leading star of stars. Now this star originally marked this constellation apart from all 48 others as the one in particular which was to be considered as the leader or governor, being the very meaning of its name, El Debaran. It is as if the prophet Enoch, believed to be the one who had originally brought forth the zodiac and its teaching, was saying that this is the place of the beginnings. It is interesting that this sign of Taurus represented the new year in the zodiac, as the waters of Noah represented a new start and a new beginning for all creatures that survived the great deluge. The sign of Taurus was considered to be the first sign in the Hebrew Zodiac. For this reason, we have assumed that this must be the very starting place of the saga. Others have thought to begin with Virgo and end with Leo, and another acceptable approach might be to begin with Pisces and end with Aries. It should be obvious that while we make this assumption regarding Taurus as a probable starting place, we do so freely and openly, while admitting that no one can truly be certain as to the true starting place, if indeed there even is one. One might begin just about anywhere in the zodiac, as each sign itself eventually ties back to the rest of the whole. Another thing we might consider is that the Hebrew alphabet begins with the first letter, A, or Aleph. You know for certain that the Hebrew Aleph represented the constellation of Taurus, representing God's eye or the all-seeing eye of God. In fact, this brightest star within the constellation was located right within the bull's eye. But finally, this word Aleph, which would be Alpha in the Greek, is the very name by which God has revealed himself to us. Those of you may be familiar with as God referring to himself as I am the Alpha and the Omega, which in Hebrew would be the Aleph and Tav, the beginning and the end. Gistav is an Akkadian name. It's an ancient name given to the brightest star within this constellation, whose name means furrow of heaven. Now the name implies or suggests that there's a somewhat deliberate carving out or creation of a channel or path designed with the purpose of leading a person to heaven that might be comparable to a needle in the arm of a phonograph following the grove in the record. We would refer to that grove as the furrow of that record. In much the same way, then, we find that we can simply set down our needle upon the furrow of heaven and follow that path which has already been prepared for us until we come full circle around to the end of the zodiac. What we are suggesting, then, is that there is without question a definite beginning that will eventually lead us to a definite end. Dilgin is another name by which we call this star, whose name simply means the messenger of light. The name bears witness to a pathway designed to lead us into truth and light, rather than lies of darkness. Within the scriptures, the Greek word for messenger is angelos, which is usually translated as angel. At the very beginning of this testimony of Enoch, we have the prophetic promise of the ultimate judgment of God that was to come upon all the earth. Enoch probably lived the first 65 years of his life as an average man, but afterwards it appears that something must have happened which changed his life. And at the age of 65, Enoch had a son, and at that time, God revealed himself to Enoch as none before. For after those first 65 years of his life had passed, the Lord declared that Enoch now walked with God in comparison to his past life preceding the birth of his son. The son that he named was Methuselah, and his name, meant when he is dead, it shall come, it referring to the great deluge, the time where water covered the earth in the days of Noah. It was not until the time of Methuselah's death that those waters came down upon the earth. And along with the doom and gloom, however, was the promise of a divine intervention, for God had promised to protect and carry those considered to be the elect of God over to a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Now, it does seem significant that the Chinese called the constellation Taurus by the name Taoleon, which means the great bridge. The name Pleiades comes from the Greek word 
clean, which means to sail, and some refer to the Pleiades as the seven sailing ones, as does their name in time. Anciently, these seven represented seven that had accompanied Noah in the ark, and were thereby saved along with him. In the Zodiac of Dendera, it shows eight souls who were bound and delivered by means of the ark of Noah. The bull that appears next to the eight souls has what appears to be a halo around his head. The symbol represented the constellation Taurus, and the halo indicated a time when there was a cycle beginning in Taurus. Twelve stars above his head represented twelve houses of the major signs on the zodiac. These eight were, of course, Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. Directly above the eight souls is a sign of Aquarius, the man who pours the water out upon the earth. The eight souls were encircled, which is intended to show that they are that which is represented by the southern fish. The Pleiades cluster consists of seven stars within the constellation of Taurus and is often regarded as a constellation in and of themselves. The name Pleiades, the cluster of stars located within the neck of the bull, means the congregation of the judge or the ruler. Now, according to the Greek myth of Europa, Zeus snatches the virgin bride from out of the earth exclusively to produce a child. The virgin bride appears to us in the myth as a virgin riding upon the back of Taurus the bull. The sign itself signifies a new beginning and a new world, as we have already indicated by its association with Noah. And we see in the sign an ancient prophecy then, regarding God himself as carrying forth his bride upon his back and transporting her over the tallying of the great bridge to the other side. As Europa rides upon the back of the bull, the bull representing Zeus himself in the myth, so likewise we see the bride being represented by the seven stars riding upon the back of this bull. The bull, of course, represents the god of light. The figure of the bull is that of a mighty snow-white animal, having horns that shone like polished gems. This Akkadian name for Taurus meant the bull of light. The ancients understood that the Messiah was to bring forth light into this world of darkness. This great bull was not truly a bull at all. More accurately, it might be described as a reem, being itself much larger and magnificent in appearance than any typical bull. For the name reem conveyed the idea of loftiness, power, and preeminence. For a man to possess the horn of this mighty animal meant that he be esteemed as a highly exalted and mighty warrior. The name Abraham, for instance, whose name means preeminent or high father, has been derived from this very root, reem. The reem is a magnificent animal commonly referred to throughout the scriptures as a unicorn in the authorized version and as a wild ox in the revised version. Within the scriptures, the reem or giant bull is more commonly called a unicorn primarily because it was a custom for a warrior, a candidate for kingship or one seeking the hand of a princess in marriage to defeat this animal and then remove one of his horns. Prophetically, the Messiah was at Abelge all three. He was to be a mighty warrior that would defeat once and forever the great enemy of the human race, and that is to say, Hasatan, or Satan himself. And second, he was also one destined to be king over all the earth. Lastly, he came forth to seek out and save his bride, and all three of these are indicated within the scriptures, speaking of the Messiah, who is called the Christ. El Mah, which is the star located in the tip of the bull's horn, causes an injury to the ankle of Orica, which means the wounded or slain. It is somewhat interesting that the horn of the bull causes injury to a shepherd's ankle. It is this very wound which opens up a passage between man and his creator, and the wound, being a tearing of the flesh of the incarnate Son of God, becomes the very door or gate that allows man to cross over the threshold into the kingdom of God. From the very beginning, this was a well-known prophecy which was given to Eve and passed down to every generation. Now it may at first seem somewhat confusing as to how this bull, who represents the very creator himself, might be equated with the enemy of the shepherd inflicting the wound in the ankle of the shepherd, while at the same time being God himself. But the answer we find within the scriptures, for although it was the sting of death delivered by the enemy that killed Christ, man esteemed that God himself had struck this prophet down for blasphemy. Within the Greek myths, the bull was believed to be a representation of Zeus, 
And in Egypt, it was, of course, a representation of the Egyptian bull god. And we know that both Osiris and his wife Isis were likewise represented as a bull in Egypt. Within the ancient religions, it was very common among the gods for the wife to assume the same attributes and characteristics as the husband. The name Isis simply means who saves or delivers. It is again interesting that the name Jesus similarly means the salvation of Jehovah. Now we would not mean to imply that Jesus and Isis are one, of course not. Nowhere throughout the scriptures do we have God suggesting that he might be called upon through the name of Isis, Osiris, Horus, Tammuz, Zeus, Jupiter, Odin, Vishnu, Brahma, we can go on and on. The fact is that the one true God has repeatedly revealed himself as being at war with all false gods. And the worship of such gods would be considered an abomination against the one true God. Isaiah 43, 11, for instance, we read, I, even I, am the Lord. Beside me there is no Savior. But this bull was also called by the name Apis, whose name meant the head or the chief. And the Messiah was to be the greatest or chief of all men ever to be born a woman. He was to be the leader destined to lead mankind into all truth, who would himself reign as the chief over every nation of the earth. This constellation Taurus is more commonly called Shur, which means coming and ruling. There was a great expectancy of this Messiah's coming throughout all the earth, and not only among the Jews. In every land and every religion, there was a great one who was to come forth into the earth to rule over mankind. Jesus was and is the Messiah prophesied by Enoch to come. If this is true, he must also be the fulfillment of the prophecies found within myths, whether they are Greek, Egyptian, Indian, Scandinavian, it goes on and on. The Messiah wears many crowns upon his head, and it is evidently being called by many different names. It seems a small thing to believe that the mighty name by which he is called is to be known only to the one who has received the white stone. But within that stone, being a symbol for the initiation into the mysteries, the secret name is written concerning which name it is said that the name is to be known only to that person who might have received it. We can see this in Revelation chapter 2, verse 17. We can interpret or speculate as to what these scriptures might mean to us, but eventually we must finally admit, in the end, the name might only truly be known by the person to whom it has been given from above. Now let it be fully understood that by whatever name he might be called by anyone on earth, there can be no greater name or higher than the very name by which he is called by his Father in heaven. And there is no mystery concerning that name. It has clearly been revealed within the scriptures in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 10, where we read, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And we know from the historical records, for instance, Nimrod was the first king of Babylon in the land of Shinar. Whether in his lifetime or sometime later, he eventually became the first monarch deified from king to divine, and ultimately he became identified with the national god of Babylon. Nimrod is just another rendering of the name Merodah, or Marduk. In the Sumerian language, he is called Amarduk, and in the Assyro-Babylonian language, he was called Marduk. Now, his wife clearly was named Semiramis, and according to what we can determine, it was Semiramis and her husband Ninus, who is said to have together founded and ruled the city of Nineveh. The very name Nineveh means the habitation of Ninus. Now, much of the mythology that we find from the earliest of man's historical records in writing seems to be unfortunately saturated with the deification of Nimrod and Semiramis, whom herself was later referred to as the Queen of Heaven. Afterwards, it was commonly taught that her own son was to be regarded as the very Messiah who was to come forth, as was promised to Eve. It is this promise that she had personally received from God, immediately following the falling away. And you can see that in Genesis. The facts seem to be somewhat undeniable, yet many reject the witness of the stars. They somehow imagine that it might be purely of satanic origin. We do not want to be misunderstood as if we were attempting to merge satanic myths with Christianity 
or trying to create a religion to incorporate all faiths. We do not claim that any god would do, or as if all gods by every different name might truly represent the one and only true god. While this is not our goal, we do desire to show without a doubt that the very foundations upon which many of these myths and early religions were built upon are found to be originally spawned from God's own mouth. All such prophecies of a Messiah who was to come to deliver the world seem to point directly to Christ. He is the one true Messiah, and he is the fulfillment of all. There is no Savior or no other name by which we must be saved, according to Acts chapter 4, verse 12. Buddha would be nothing in comparison, and Krishna would be void of power to save. Tammuz is merely a myth, and we can go on and on about all gods. However, the great spiritual truths and prophecies which we find preserved throughout the many religions of this world do seem to originate from one common source. All seem to point to Jesus Christ as the promised Savior, who must come to deliver the earth and all of Adam's children. So let us attempt to focus upon the prophecies and preserve spiritual truths and not upon the individual myth in particular, or in the so-called historical fulfillment. For many came before Christ, and undoubtedly many surely must follow, proclaiming themselves to be something great, as even Jesus prophesied himself in Matthew chapter 24, 4-5, and even to the proclaiming of themselves to be the very one who was to come. But all of these prophets, or prophets so called, are merely thieves and robbers of Jesus' own words, as we shall soon discover. But for now, let us proceed. In Isaiah chapter 43, verse 11, God declares, I am I, even I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no Savior. Within the Greek myths, Taurus was a sign representing Zeus. It was written that Zeus, being an form of bull, had descended upon the earth to take out from among the virgins a wife for himself. That maiden whom he had chosen was named Europa, and Europa climbed upon the back of the bull and hung on tightly to his horns as he carried her on top of the waters. Europa is represented by the Pleiades clusters, which is also called the Seven Sisters. And while the sun travels a circular path around the earth known as the ecliptic, which we know in actuality that the earth circles the sun, the moon makes twelve complete revolutions around the earth. Each revolution divides a pathway so that each is considered to be a step along the path. The word zodiac is derived from the primitive root zoad, which means a walkway. And each step along the ecliptic is said to be a sign of the zodiac, and each sign contains three other constellations that are anciently referred to as deacon constellations, meaning a part or a piece of. So then the next constellation to be considered would be the first deacon of the sign of Taurus. Within the Bible, this constellation is named Kisser. It is the same word that is used to name the entire zodiac and all the deacons as one complete group. It is most interesting that within the beginning of the twelve signs, there was one word given to represent the entire group of 48 constellations, while at the same time representing just one of the 48. And as we study each sign, we will consider each of the associated deacon signs as well. For there is not necessarily any predetermined order by which we would rank the deacons. We do not choose Orion as the first deacon because it was absolutely first. We could have chosen Origa as the first deacon and Orion as the third if we chose to do so. We know a sign by definition as a symbol. To represent something else, and the letters within the alphabet are symbols or signs of sounds. The numerals we use in our numerical systems are merely symbols to represent actual numbers, or at least the idea of numbers, and even the notes on a clap or musical writings are signs or symbols representing musical tones. The symbols are merely a mechanism to preserve and to pass along sounds, thoughts, ideas from one person to another passed down from one generation to another. Obviously, the symbols or sign themselves have absolutely no relationship to the actual sounds, or the actual number, or the actual musical tone. They are merely signs that are agreed upon by a given society to represent what they represent. So then, when God says that the stars, the sun, and the moons are to be given to man as signs, which we see clearly in Genesis chapter 1, verse 14, what does he mean by this? 
do the scriptures imply, by the very definition of the word, that these signs must out of necessity represent something more than the mere celestial luminaries that they physically are? It would seem so. Otherwise, how can they be referred to as signs at all? For we know that God said, let there be light, lights in the firmament, of the heaven to divide the day from the night, let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. We see that in verse 14 of chapter 1 of Genesis. If God created the stars, the planets, the moon, and the sun as signs to represent something other than their obvious physical purpose, we must conclude that he himself has also sanctioned their very use for this purpose. He must have out of necessity at some point in time revealed to men what these signs were supposed to have represented. It seems that God and man had to have at least at some point in time come to some agreement or conclusion as to what the signs represented. If this were not the case, the stars could not have been signs at all. By definition, the meaning of a sign or a symbol must be agreed upon between two people, or there is no communication between the two people, and the signs would completely lose their meaning, and therefore they are not truly signs at all. What we shall soon discover is not only are the constellations meant to be understood as signs and symbols representing something entirely arbitrary as to their physical or elemental natures, but also that these symbols were anciently defined by God. Further, they are used or referred to within the very pages of our holy scriptures, and to ignore the signs implies that we shall miss the actual meaning of the symbols as they are elsewhere employed within the scriptures. It is interesting that the most misunderstood book in the Bible among Christians is the revelation of Jesus Christ as brought forth by the Apostle John. The reason for such great confusion, as we discover, is that the book is thoroughly saturated with heavenly signs and symbols which have been defined years ago through Adam, Seth, and Enoch. The first deacon of a sign of Taurus is named Kessel. It is actually the constellation that we call by the name Orion. The Kiso is the same word that is used to name the entire zodiac, as we've said before, and encompasses not only the twelve major constellations, but all their deacons as well into one group, or naming it as one group. It's most interesting that within this beginning of the twelve signs, there is one word given to represent the entire group of 48 constellations, while at the same time representing just one of the 48. The Hebrew word kessel is usually rendered foolish or fool. The name, as we have already shown, was given to the entire group of stars within the zodiac. The name seems to have been given in an attempt at describing the great foolishness of the enemy Satan in his attempt at trying to overthrow the kingdom of heaven. For the Jews, however, Orion eventually came to be thought of as Nimrod, that mighty great hunter and rebel against God. This sign came to represent the evil one, or a rebel, due to Orion being equated with Nimrod. And the identification of Orion with Nimrod was perhaps the greatest achievement, might be considered as the most serious religious error deliberately perpetuated by the mysterious worship of Nimrod. For Satan has successfully masqueraded his seed as a seed of promise, causing his seed to take the place of the promised seed, which the signs of the heavens declared. Satan is a great counterfeiter, and his nature is somewhat of a chameleon. When we understand this successful masquerading of the evil one, we are only then beginning to have our eyes open to the ancient truths preserved for us within the everlasting Gospels of the heavens. For Orion had originally represented the Messiah, who was to come to overthrow the very Satan and reclaim the kingdom. The Babylonian priesthood taught that Nimrod was this promised Messiah who was to come. And so throughout the entire world, Nimrod came to be equated with Orion. And as a result of this, the entire pageant of the teachings within the Zodiac relating to the promised Messiah had now also became associated with Nimrod himself. 
This led to great confusion among the peoples of the earth, and the truth about the Messiah's coming became shrouded due to this abominable association with Nimrod. This constellation of Orion is said to be perhaps the most brilliant of all constellations. He is the central figure, as we shall make absolutely clear, and the very focus of the entire pageant or story, which we have discovered to be reported within the stars. Now, because the Jews had described Nimrod as being both arrogant and foolish, they wrongly attributed the name Kessel to the constellation, which they thought to represent him. Now, we have to admit that the Jews were certainly not alone in their assignment of this sign to Nimrod, but the ancient Persians likewise recognized this sign to be the equivalent to Nimrod himself. But this is only due to the multitude of teachings which flourished by the mouths of the Babylonian priesthood, for it is known that they sought everywhere to honor and glorify Nimrod as a god. The fact remains, there is absolutely no proof whatsoever that the original intention or meaning of the sign had anything at all to do with Nimrod. On the other hand, we can safely say without any doubt or disagreement that any such reference of Orion in association to the historical Nimrod must out of necessity have followed the flood of Noah. If we may but assume that the testimony of Josephus concerning the origin of the Zodiac and its age are relatively true. In other words, we might quickly conclude that if Josephus is correct regarding at least the great age of the Zodiac, then the actual meaning of the sign could never have referred to Nimrod, for we must then accept that the Zodiac had somehow been handed down by the Antediluvians, as each of their lives had preceded the birth and flood of Noah. So what can we say regarding the confusion for the Jews? We know that the Jews came to eventually refer to Orion as Gibor, a name which meant the giant, the mighty hunter, and even the mightiest of them all. For perhaps they regarded Nimrod as being among the offspring of the sons of God, which we have in Genesis chapter 6, verse 4. However, there is no such statement within the scriptures that Nimrod was numbered among them. If this be the case, one would think that the scriptures would declare Nimrod himself to be among the giants, as is written also of Goliath. If Orion did represent Nimrod, then Orion himself must be regarded as the greatest criminal of all, being the great and mighty rebel against God. The facts remain, however, that this being that is represented within the constellation was represented throughout the many nations as he who was the mightiest and greatest of all heroes ever born of a woman. It was because of the latter association of Orion with the word Kessel. The word itself came to connote a strong one, a hero, a giant, and not the other way around. Many have demonstrated that Nimrod can be traced back to the founder of Babylon. Further, it can plainly be shown that Nimrod, his wife, Semiramis, and their messianic son, Tammuz, who is supposed to be Nimrod, reborn, are the figures worshipped throughout the many religious myths and prophecies recorded within the stars. And this has led to the belief that Nimrod himself must have been responsible for the origin of the zodiac and the teachings associated with the constellations. Let there be no mistake about this one thing. We do not want to suggest that the worship attached to these signs are acceptable by God, or in any way should be considered as harmless. The word of God is quick and sharp against such matters, and the scriptures instruct us we should not be embarrassed, overwhelmed, or afraid of the signs of the heavens. They further instruct us that the pagan customs of worship that commonly surrounded such signs were utterly vain, worthless, unprofitable, and even deceitful. We know that Nimrod was the founder of Babylon, and it was at Babylon that the languages of all people were confounded. Likewise, Nimrod was the founder of spiritual Babylon, along with all of her confounding of the religious truths. The spiritual Babylon is called the great spiritual horror by the Apostle John, and he regards the teachings of Babylon as being the enemy of all pure religion, spiritual truth, and light. In fact, in Revelation chapter 17, verse 5, he writes, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. The entire celestial pageant might easily be summarized as the great rebellion of Lucifer, along with the violence that has spawned from that rebellion. As within this great heavenly pageant, there is one central figure and one central story. So likewise, Orion is the very one of whom this story is about. For Orion, 
that is the true Orion, is the very one who has prophesied to come. It is that Orion himself who is that Messiah who is to be manifested to destroy the works of the enemy, to restore everything that has been lost, as is recorded in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So the word Kessel actually connoted a strong one, a hero and a giant. But while the word seems to have been indicative of the utter foolishness of the attempt by Lucifer to defeat the kingdom of God, it is also spoken of that mighty one of God who would come forth to regain the lost kingdom and to defeat the great and powerful enemy. It is commonly taught within certain sects of the Christian church that Lucifer represented the first king of the earth. For ages before Adam was ever created, Lucifer reigned on the earth as a king. That earth ended in complete annihilation. However, Lucifer never desired to surrender his throne. This was the reason for God bringing forth Adam to begin with. Adam was to be of the earth, coming from the earth, to become the successor to the earth's throne. Lucifer, understanding Adam's destiny murdered him, so he might regain control of the throne of the earth. Now Orion is imagined as facing Taurus, the mighty bull in battle, much as Hercules is said to have fought the Cretan bull. This notion at first seems to catch us off guard, because we would be expecting Orion's battle to be against the enemy of God rather than against God himself. But we must always keep in mind that when it comes to man's current sinful condition, God is man's enemy. For it is God who is the judge of man's sinfulness, and it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands to face one's own judgment. At times we have the tendency to forget how Jesus himself had to endure both God's judgments and his wrath for the purpose of setting us free. Does it not stand to reason that if Christ had to face a fearful God face to face, that we also would find ourselves in a similar state if it were not that? We had the benefit of Christ as a mediator to stand between God and us. But thanks be to God that the price has been paid in full. So often it seems that no matter how hard we try to get the word out, this message is not clearly getting to the world. Heaven is not something that everyone gains simply because God is so loving and full of compassion. Our salvation was bought and paid with an extremely expensive price. Nobody gets past the judgment seat without first having paid the price. Now the good news is, we do not have to pay the price, for the price has already been paid on our behalf. We read in the scriptures in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 16, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. And we realize that there is a war that must be fought. And there is an armor of God and weapons that we bring into battle. In his hand, Orion holds a mighty club, which according to the myth had been forged out of a special unbreakable bronze alloy. Within his other hand, he holds forth his shield. That shield is the pelt of a Cleonian lion. The lion's pelt was impervious to any weapon made of iron, bronze, or stone. And as sons of God, we are also to be covered with the invulnerable pelt of the Lion of Judah, which is simply our shield of faith. Upon Orion's girdle hangs a sharp sword. The scriptures instruct us that the sword of the Spirit is our offensive weapon. However, it is not used with hands but comes forth from out of our mouths. The greatest weapon which Christ has equipped us with is the word of God which comes forth from our own lips. The hilt of this sword, which is most noteworthy, contains the head and body of a lamb. The star in Orion's foot is named Regal, which means the foot that crushes. By this star we are reminded how the mighty one who is to come shall come forth to crush the head, his enemy. The brightest star within the constellation Orion, being located in the right shoulder, is Betelgeuse, which means the coming of the branch. That branch, of course, according to the scriptures, is the Holy One of God. And the name is derived from Ibn al-Jazu which means the armpit of the central one. The central one is Orion, meaning to say that he is the central focus of the entire heavenly story. The star in his left shoulder is called the Latris, 
which means quickly coming, swiftly destroying, and the roaring conqueror. Now it is well known that Orion is usually identified with the Sumerian Gilgamesh, and Gilgamesh is also called by the name Ura'ana, which is a Akkadian word, which means the light of heaven. Within the Egyptian zodiac of Dendera, the constellation Orion was given them the name Hagat, which means this is he who triumphs. The hieroglyphic characters underneath the sign of Orion read Or, which is the very word meaning light. Within the Egyptian zodiac of Dendera, the constellation Orion was given them the name Hagat, which means this is he who triumphs. The hieroglyphic characters underneath the sign of Orion read Or, which is the very word meaning light. The name Orion is derived from the word Oarian, which means coming forth as light. Is it mere coincidence that Jesus continually associated himself with this figure of Orion, which we have represented within the heavens? Surely the wonderful and glorious things which we see clearly before us have not been hidden under a bushel, but rather they have been set up high upon their own lampstand shedding their light over the entire face of the world. According to the prophecies within the stars, Orion is that mighty triumphant warrior who is to come forth from the heavens. In some parts of the world, he is equated to be the sun god and called by the name Demuzi, which is a Chaldean or Assyrian name, meaning the son of light. The Hindu identified him as a storm god and Phoenician. He was the sun god. Within the Egyptian Book of the Dead, was taught that the soul of Osiris was to be found within this constellation. And in Egypt he was also called Sahu, who also was said to be the very soul of Horus. It is said that Orion had been given one of the great miraculous powers that no other man could duplicate. This one sign was given to him to help distinguish and identify him from any human impostor, such as Nimrod, for example, who might attempt to proclaim himself as being that Orion who had come in the flesh. Orion had been given this special power by Poseidon himself, and that special gift was the ability to walk upon the water as if it were ground beneath his feet. It is interesting how Orion is often represented as if being able to walk upon the water of the river Eridanus, which is set immediately before his feet, and is also a deacon constellation. Was this sign that would identify him as being the true Orion? And we need only to examine him by the prophecies that precede him. Now it is strange that these prophecies do not originate from the Old Testament. We do not find any prophet walking upon the waters, but rather do we find their origin within the constellations. By walking upon the water, we must admit that Jesus was indeed, whether consciously and deliberately, or whether merely accidentally proclaiming himself to be that very Messiah who is to be associated with this constellation of whom the ancients have named Orion. By doing this, then, we suggest that Jesus was actually declaring to the Gentiles without even speaking a word that this is he who triumphs, this is the light of heaven, this is the roaring conqueror coming swiftly to destroy and to crush the enemy under his feet which is the meaning of the stars within the constellation of Orion. Did Jesus not know of the ancient Gentile prophecies and so mistakenly showed the world that he himself was the Orion who the Gentiles taught would one day come forth to reclaim the throne? Could it be a mere coincidence or happenstance? The birth of Orion was to be the result of some miraculous intervention of the gods, and Orion was born to depose the current king from his throne. As we follow the myths through to the end, we discover that one particular king had simply refused to resign his throne, and even at the close of his predetermined term. Now to prove himself fit to be accepted as a new king, and to be awarded the daughter of the king to be his wife, Orion would be required to successfully complete all the tasks that would be assigned to him. It is said that Orion loved the seven daughters known as the Pleiades who ride upon the back of Taurus. The greatest task of all would include the defeat of every beast that threatened the lives of the inhabitants of the earth. 
he must take dominion over all creatures that move upon the face of the earth. Now this is the very task that the biblical Adam, being identified himself as the first Adam, had failed to accomplish. The second Adam, however, who is called Orion, the promised Messiah, does succeed in taking back and reclaiming his dominion over the entire earth as well as over every living creature upon the earth. That was the dominion that Adam had lost and Jesus had regained. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, this was said concerning Adam. And God blessed them, and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. It had been prophesied and commonly taught that every creature was to be easily subdued by Orion except for one gigantic scorpion who was said to have come forth from underneath the earth. This scorpion would prophetically cause the death of Orion. In reality, he causes the death of not only the first Adam, but the second one, Jesus, as well. We will, of course, consider the meaning of Scorpio. For now, however, let us simply be content with the meal which we have on our plates before us. For we shall surely get to the rest of these great jewels as we progress. In one version of the myth, Orion must have had both of his eyes put out. This is yet another prophetic sign to prove him when he arrives that he himself is the one promised to come. What might the blindness mean or represent? For we cannot say that Jesus himself was blind, can we? Within the Old Testament, we have a story of Samson, whose life, like that of Orion, represented a prophecy or type of Christ. Interesting that Samson was the mightiest man who lived upon the earth and was also marked with a lion's pelt, as both the counterparts Orion and Hercules were. Samson killed the mighty lion, and some believe that afterwards he might very well have worn its belt, which is clearly told us within the Gentile myths. However, it never says really in the scriptures that Samson wore this belt. The symbol of wearing the pelt merely demonstrates how the strength of the mighty enemy had now been added to his own strength. But the blindness of Samson and his triumph from the pit is most certainly a type of prophecy of Christ. For in their death, both Samson and the Messiah would accomplish much more in their lives. The blindness in the eyes of Samson was merely a picture of the death of the Messiah. And it was a prophecy showing that the great mighty Messiah who was to come must be put to death so that through death he might gain access into the very heart of the enemy's domain. Afterward, he would cast down the pillars, thereby delivering his people from the satanic bondage. According to the prophecy of Orion, his eyes were to be healed. If Orion's blindness represents the death of the Messiah, what then might the healing of his eyes represent? It represents the resurrection from the dead. In the midst of Egypt, Horus had suffered the sting of the scorpion and died. Through the intercession of Isis, the power of Ra raised Horus from the dead, and it is interesting. Within the Greek myths, it is Artemis who pleads with Asclepius to raise Orion from the dead. However, in this account, for some reason, Zeus struck down Asclepius with a thunderbolt before he was able to comply with her request. But once again, we will consider this later when we examine the sign of Scorpio in the life of Asclepius. Another star within the constellation showing that Messiah is to be wounded is Scyph, which is the star in the right leg, which means bruised, being the very word used in scripture in Genesis 3.15 to speak of the bruising of the Messiah. Another star within this constellation is Almatic, which is located right in the belt, which means the wounded one. We see the Messiah must be wounded to fulfill the prophecies concerning him. It is difficult in considering all this to find any valid reason for the Jews to have misunderstood these prophecies. It appears that even the Gentiles knew the Messiah must first be wounded for the sake of the rest of the world before he might triumph over his enemy. And this is clearly seen in Isaiah chapter 53 verse 5. Yet another star within the constellation is Metatha, which is located in the belt of Orion and which means the dividing as a sacrifice. Other stars within the constellation indicate that Orion himself, the Messiah, is to triumph in the end. One of these stars is named al Rai, which means who bruises or breaks. Another star is Thabit, which means treading on, as if in defeat. 
In both cases, the names refer to the defeating of the great enemy who wages war against this Messiah. In addition, there are many other stars within the constellation Orion that indicate he is a mighty and strong prince who has promised to come forth. For instance, the stars Al Gibor and Nitla, both translated the mighty. The star Nux is translated the strong, and the star Al Najed is translated the prince who is prophesied to come forth. Heka is a star translated as coming or the coming one, and Masa is the one coming forth as the branch or the star El Iauza, which is translated the branch. He's coming forth not only to defeat the enemy, but to rule over the entire earth. Another star, El Mirzam, which means the ruler. Each of these stars tells us in a voice and language of their own, which every man in every place might easily hear and recognize as an own tongue. Now we come to the second deacon of Taurus, named Iridanus. It's represented as a mythical river that flowed into the great oceans that surrounded all land and water. The brightest star in this constellation is Achernur, which means the after part of the river. Other stars are named Zore, Oza, and Feet, which means flowing, the going forth, and the mouth of the river. What's the significance of this river and the teaching behind it? In mythology, the river is especially significant because it is the river that received the body of Phaethon. Now, Phaethon was not a mere mortal being. He was the son of Helios, the sun god. The story of Phaethon somewhat parallels the biblical story of Lucifer. For Lucifer was the anointed cherub that protected the original earth ages before God created Adam. Now, many are unaware that there was a pre-Adamic earth that preceded Adam's earth by what could have been many millions of years. The Bible is relatively silent about the time between the first earth, wherein Lucifer reigned as king, and the new earth that had been given to Adam to reign as king. We do read in the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 28, verse 14, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth, and I have set thee so. Thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. Thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. This is, many believe, a reference to Lucifer, the anointed cherub in that time period. Lucifer dwelt among the holy mountain of God. The mountain of God is commonly referred to by various names throughout the religions of this world. Among the most popular names are Zion, Asgard, and Olympus. This mountain was Lucifer's original habitation, which is the dwelling place of the gods. Christians would refer to such a place as heaven. Christians in general have been so thoroughly indoctrinated within their own church doctrine that they might be somewhat surprised to learn that beings, which they refer to as angels, are actually heavenly beings which God named the gods. Our Creator calls them the Elohim, which is to be translated as the gods rather than the angels. The word angel is simply a word that our churches have derived from the Greek word, which merely means messenger. It is somewhat incorrect to refer to these beings as messengers, as they are not all messengers as Gabriel himself is said to be, but they are all ministering spirits. We deliberately refer to these beings as the angels rather than the gods and attempt to create or form a permanent breach between the pagan mythology and Christianity within the minds of parishioners. This might have served its purpose at one time in the past, but as we can readily see from the things that we have already considered and shall continue to reveal, the true breach between the gods and the angels or mythology and Christianity, is not really as great as our church leaders might have us to believe. And so we see that this Lucifer had once ruled the earth as God's appointed governor or ruler. The story of Phaethon helps us to confirm what we already know about Lucifer and can perhaps 
help us to better understand what might have transpired. For knowing inside himself that he was no mere mortal, Phaethon was not content with simply being what he was and knowing what he was. Neither was he patient to wait for his time to become what he had been destined to become. Like Lucifer, Phaethon was not satisfied with the position and the honor that God had originally given to him. Like Korah, he was not content to do the service for the Lord and minister to the congregation. He wanted more. I recommend you look at Numbers chapter 16, verse 9 through 10 in the story about Korah and his rebellion. But going back to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 15, where it's clearly speaking of Lucifer, we read, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Phaethia not only wanted to rule the earth and to be set above his peers and his subjects, but he additionally desired to have them bow down before him, to proclaim him as being worthy of receiving their worship. Lucifer had also sought to be worshipped by the inhabitants of the earth at that time. Lucifer had finally decided that if God would not give him what he wanted, he himself would make it happen through his own efforts. We see that in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 13, where it is written concerning him, For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Day after day, Fabian continually meditated upon how he might prove to the inhabitants of the earth that he was worthy of receiving their worship, and how that they should esteem him as being equal to all other gods that received honor and adoration. Lucifer was the king of the earth. He had already been wrapped around in glory and majestic splendor. But this apparently was not enough for him. He would not be satisfied until he himself would be considered equal to the God who created him. It is said that Phaethon plagued his father day after day by requesting that he might be given opportunity to prove himself and to demonstrate his divine abilities before men, believing within himself that they would naturally give him the praise and worship he felt he deserved. If only they could see his power and be made to marvel at his superior abilities, one can easily enough detect the arrogance and pride of the words of Lucifer within the sacred scriptures. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse 14, when we read, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Although this same Phaethian had been greatly superior to the other inhabitants of the earth, being himself the son of Helios, the sun god, and therefore truly possessing divine attributes, his father had informed him that he was much too inexperienced to stand in that office and the position which he sought after and desired. Now we might glean from this that Lucifer had previously discussed his desires with his creator on many different occasions. The Father God must have informed him that, although he did truly possess great spiritual powers, skills and abilities naturally positioning him, miles above any of those of whom he had been given authority over, he simply did not have enough strength within himself, which was absolutely required to take upon himself that which he lusted after. To do so would only result in his own destruction. The repeated warnings and advice of the Father's wisdom were to no avail, and eventually, when the opportunity finally came, both Lucifer and Phaethon took the reins into their own hands. This action is described as attempting to take control of the chariot of the sun. This is just another way of saying to set him up as equal to God, which we have recorded in Ezekiel chapter 28 verse 17 where we read, Thine heart was lifted up because of thy beauty. Thou hast corrupted thy wisdom by reason of thy brightness. Now, although his father had warned him, he simply had no respect for this warning. Despising the admonition of his father, he continued to feed 
his inward desire to seek the glory that simply was not rightfully his to seek. He continued to feed the sinful desire within himself, and eventually that sin would finally take occasion to act out the lust within his heart. And so we see in Ezekiel 28:15, Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. Now evidently, believing himself to be wiser than his father, he had planned a certain scheme, which would finally end in an almost complete annihilation of the earth, as well as his own complete ruin. The Bible instructs us of how the first earth, which should properly be called the pre-Adamic earth, that first earth had been created a beautiful paradise. It had, as a result of the sinful activity, now become a complete ruin. Evidently the earth had been scorched with fire, and this was then followed by the Ice Age, which science itself will testify to. As a result of his sin, Phaethon was judged and cast out of the presence of God to be vanquished or plunged into a literal lake of fire. Now within the scriptures, the reference to Lucifer is that of one being cast out of the mountain of the kingdom of God. In Ezekiel 28, verse 16, we read, By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned. Therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God, and I will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Now, being inexperienced and having insufficient strength to control the reins of the four white horses, Phaethon had lost control of the chariot of the sun. Such loss of control is described as causing a chain reaction of evil events that cause the earth to be scorched by the sun, while at the same time causing the entire earth to be plunged into a deep, cold darkness. This great darkness would have resulted in freezing many of the living inhabitants of the earth, there have been actual findings of creatures upon this earth being suddenly covered in ice as a result of some great cataclysmic event. This original creation had been completely and totally destroyed as a direct result of the rebellion and sin of Lucifer. Of this the Bible is very clear in Isaiah chapter 14 verses 15 through 17. Now we also read, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was Upon the face of the deep, we see that in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2. This first earth was literally made a wilderness, and the destruction was so much so that the original creation is described as being completely formless. The original earth, which had once been populated by trees, animals, and even inhabitants, of whom it is said that they had erected cities, as we also have done, and now became nothing but a great void, that void we just saw in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Although the original creation had been destroyed, God took it upon himself to do some serious remodeling. This remodeling, or remaking of the earth, took six days of effort. Now at the end of this six-day restoration period, God had made a man in his own image. This man was to reign as a king. It is interesting that the same kinds of destructive forces are destined to again sweep across the planet. This also might be attributed to the fallen angel who once sought to be made equal with God. The scripture seems to echo the first destruction of the pre-Adamic earth while predicting a similar destruction. The great mountain burning with fire is cast into the sea and that great mountain assuredly represents a great kingdom we see in Revelation chapter 8, verses 7 through 9. This future destruction of the earth as foretold within the prophecy of Revelation chapter 8, verse 7 through 9, also describes a great burning of trees and grass. The ships in the great ocean are to be destroyed, as well as many of the sea-dwelling creatures. The waters are filled with blood of creatures which are violently torn apart, and God calls this great being the destroying mountain, or king, crediting him with the complete destruction of the entire planet. We see that in Jeremiah chapter 51, verses 25 
at 63 through 64. Now as for Fathian himself, it is written that Fathian fell from heaven as a burning torch after being judged and punished by Zeus. Interesting enough, this is the same sentence pronounced upon Lucifer. Refer to Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12, where we read, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut to the ground, which should weaken the nations? And back to Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 18, where we read, Thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities, by the iniquity of thy traffic. Therefore will I bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, it shall devour thee, and I will bring thee to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Now it would seem that Zeus had hurled a thunderbolt at Fathian, thereby causing his flesh to be consumed from off his bones, to stand as an everlasting judgment against such grave misconduct and disobedience. In his pre-existent form, Jesus was there to witness it all. In the New Testament, he describes Lucifer's punishment as falling from heaven, as lightning. In Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Even after many years had passed, it was said that the body of Athian still smoldered in the river into which he fell. Now, the biblical concept of the lake of fire is very similar to this image of Athian's body continually burning forever. We just look in Revelation chapter 20, verses 10. The lake of fire was not created for sinful men. However, God will allow man to go there if he himself ignorantly chooses to do so. The lake of fire has actually been created for Satan and his demons. The gospel is a simple message of hope to all those who might simply hear and believe. Now one star located within the constellation Eridanus is named Cursa. It's at the source of the river, and it means to be bent down, but it is derived from al Kursi al Jaza, which means the footstool of the central one. And that central one, of course, has been identified as Orion, who we've already spoken about. The star located at the bend in the river is named Zerai, which means flowing, and the Hebrew name is Dara, which would be translated as bent and suggests an idea of being bent in a particular direction as if by force, much the same as if one would bend a bow in a certain direction, as witnessed within the scriptures, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 13. The word Dirac also gives us the idea, however, of walking on and threshing down or treading upon, as is used within another scripture, that is Psalms chapter 91, verses 13 through 14. The idea conveyed to us by these two stars, then, is the abstraction of the enemy Satan and his being made the footstool or having him placed under the feet of the body of Christ who shall eventually tread underfoot that great enemy of mankind. It most definitely speaks of the punishment of this angel who had previously exalted himself but has now been cast down and made to be nothing. We see that in the Hebrews chapter 10 verses 12 through 14 Romans chapter 16, verse 20, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 21 through 22. And then we come to the final deacon of Taurus, and that is the constellation Origa, which we have already considered to a very small degree, but now we need to expand upon it. We consider this sign as last, but don't get the idea that this implies that this is of lesser importance than the first. For we are currently unaware of any predetermined or original ordering of these deacon constellations. However, we have simply chosen to consider them in the order that seems to fit best for our purposes. Now in Egypt, the constellation Auriga is regarded as a representation of Horus, and the star located within the head of the shepherd is named Prajapati, which is a Hindu word. That means the Lord of created beings. Now who might the shepherd of the sheep be? It would seem that he is to be identified with the very creator of all beings that exist. He is the same one we find in John chapter 10 verse 11 or verses 14 through 16. 
he is Jesus. Within this Egyptian zodiac of Dendera, Auriga is represented as carrying a scepter instead of the small animals he holds in the more common representation of the constellation. The man is called Trun, whose name means scepter or power. The scepter itself is somewhat interesting and even strange in appearance. At the top of the scepter is the head of a goat, while its bottom ends in the appearance of a cross. The cross commonly represented the Egyptian symbol for eternal life. Within the Greek myth, Onimus was the king who had refused to resign his throne even at the close of his term. We can readily see who or what this represents. We know that it was Lucifer who had once reigned upon this earth ages before the creation of Adam and then Lucifer rightly had possession of the throne, but now dawned a new age upon the earth and among the inhabitants who dwelled upon this planet. As far as God was concerned, a new day had come, and now a new ruler had been brought forth, and Adam was brought forth to inherit and occupy the throne of God upon the earth, and he was told to take dominion over every living creature that lived upon the earth. This we see clearly in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Now Onesimus had been informed by a prophetic utterance that his kingdom would be passing on to another. This king had gone to extreme measures in an attempt to prevent that prophecy from coming to pass. Now such is simply the story of Adam and the serpent. Lucifer would try everything within his power to defeat this man and thereby prevent him from ever succeeding him or taking away his earthly throne. As far as Lucifer was concerned, this earth had rightly belonged to him. He has never intended to let it pass into the hands of another without a good fight. We ask that you simply take note that in the temptation of Jesus by the devil, how the devil claims that the kingdoms had belonged to him. Note also, this statement was in no way contested or refuted by Christ. I refer to Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. Now we realize that for some, the very thought of Satan possessing and reigning as king upon the earth must be a completely and totally foreign idea. However, according to the Bible, Satan is currently considered to be the god of this world. See the writings of the Apostle Paul, for instance, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 3 through 4. It seems that Satan himself must have possessed this earth long before the existence of Adam. And because he was successful in defeating Adam, he had evidently never lost his throne upon the earth. We need to be very careful to note how that Adam's own dominion and the actual act of his taking possession of the kingdom was completely contingent and absolutely dependent upon Adam himself doing that taking in Genesis chapter 1 verse 28. The fact is that Adam failed miserably and due to his great failure, man had never realized the dominion of this earth until Christ had finally defeated Satan in his own day. Now it is taught that King Onimus had arranged for a particular chariot race, in the which he himself would catch up to his daughter's suitor, and afterward murder him. By continuing in this activity, he had hoped to prevent his successor from deposing him and claiming the throne for himself. The ancient prophecies concerning the man who would eventually dispose Onimus as king and succeed him among the throne had also indicated that this man would also be the man who would marry the king's own daughter. But this is the same story repeatedly surfacing throughout the prophecies of the Zodiac. It was known throughout the earth that the Messiah or Savior was to take out a bride for himself even from this sinful world. Now we must ask ourselves, how can this bride be the daughter of the king? If this king is a type of Satan himself, in this question we find opportunity to demonstrate the absolute necessity that everyone must come through the Father and through the blood of Christ. Not all men and women are born the children of God. To be born of God requires a divine intervention on the part of God. We see that very clearly in John chapter 1, verse 12. It does not happen naturally or automatically. Associated with becoming a child of God is a great cost, so great in fact, we ourselves could never hope to pay. 
in general, unless one has received special right power and authority to become a child of God, as is indicated within the scriptures, they are considered as being numbered among the children of the devil. Clearly, look at John chapter 8, verse 44. This is because the devil virtually owns everything upon the earth, which is, of course, until he is finally and completely dispossessed of his throne. The person whom we have represented by this consolation is said to correspond to the mythical Merlis, the famed charioteer, who had devised a certain plan to cause the king to be killed in the chariot crash. The chariot race was the evil scheme of the king, and that king has already been identified as representing Lucifer or Satan himself. What we have next is the counter plan. By his wisdom and efforts, Auriga's plan will cause the king to be defeated, suggesting that Messiah will conquer over the king in the end. Look at the parallels in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19, 25, 27. Now this fame, murderless, to cause the king's chariot to crash, is said to have removed bronze linchpins from within the wheels, replacing them with linchpins made of wax. Now during the race, the wax pins would slowly begin to melt. The king would suddenly crash to his death exactly according to how Myrtilus had planned it to happen. The Hebrew root from which the name Auriga is derived is shepherd, and in the more common representations of the constellation, this shepherd has a she-goat clinging to his bosom. One star located within this constellation is named Ayak, whose name means wounded. The brightest star of the constellation is located within the she-goat. The star is named Lioth or Capella, which means in the body of the goat. Both names simply mean she-goat, and this star was especially important and given special place within the ancient religions. The star was identified with the god Tal who was also called the Opener, and the Akkadian name is Dilgan Iku, which means the Messenger of Light. The star was also known as the Star of Marduk, and this is interesting as we recall that Jesus himself was said to be that Opener and the Door of the Sheeple in John chapter 10, verse 3 and 9. Now in India, this constellation was called by the name Brahma, Radaya, which means the Heart of Brahma. In Babylon, the star was named Dilgan Babil, and considered to be the heavenly being that guarded and protected Babylon. Within his left hand, Auriga the shepherd supports two little kids, and the star named Gedi, which literally means kids, marks these two little kids. Other stars found within this constellation are Menkilinen, which is located in the right arm of the shepherd, and Maaz which gives the meaning the band or chain of the goats and flock of the goats. The shepherd appears to be seated upon the Milky Way as the protector and savior of his flock. 